Windows. Uh, Windows yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the same. All right, guys. Uh, it's, 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 it's a little bit different. It's rough. <laughs> Welcome yeah. to your last operating system presentation. Congratulations on making it through the class this semester. Or I guess you haven't made it through yet, but almost made it through the class. Yeah, I got excited. So what we're going to be focusing on today, I'm going to go over some logistical stuff, then we'll take any questions on the current problem set, and then we'll kind of just move into questions on anything else in review for the final, which you guys all have Monday. Um, I'm recovering from a cold and I've been talking all morning, so I'll try not to lose my voice during this lecture, but we'll see how I go. Logistics, there, you should all be working on your problem set five, Right now, it's due Friday night. You can either turn it online by 11.55 via the usual upload, scan, upload, Moodle method. Uh, also, we have the two review sessions on Friday at 1 and 2. Those will be your last opportunity to turn it in in person. So if you want to turn in a hard copy of PA5, turn it in. I do have some problem sets to return to you, and I completely forgot them on my desk. So I will bring those to the review sessions on Friday if people are just curious to get their physical copies back. Uh, the grader only gave me problem set two. I'm hoping you can get me problem set three and four by Friday as well. So hopefully I'll have a decent stack of papers to turn back. If you uploaded it online, there's nothing to turn back to you. Those were just graded online. So make sure you get that submitted, worked on. Uh, it's all due Friday night or in person Friday afternoon. Review sessions are at 1 and 2 o'clock on Friday. We will be going over the final. Uh, we're going to start a little bit today, but it'll basically be a question and answer session. That means you do need to arrive with questions. There's no practice midterm this time, so if no one has questions, there's really nothing for me to do other than stand there and look pretty. So try to review beforehand. Do show up with questions. Unless you guide what I'm going to talk about, then I don't know how useful it's going to really be to anyone. So show up either with questions or tell me what to talk about. I will appreciate it. It'll be 50 minutes. There'll be 50 minute blocks. I will try to structure them such that if you come to the first one and you want to come to the second one, I'll try to take new questions in the second one before I take before I take repeat questions in the second one. So if you want to maximize your studying time, come at one o'clock and stay through the second review session until we get to the point where I start repeating questions you've already seen. Um, so yeah, I will I will try to structure in that manner to maximize your time if you want to try to stay through both. If you just come to the second, you'll just get through whatever questions we get through. That's fine, too. And the C cell again? Yes, so we have the C cell lab, same place. So just a little computer lab there in the middle of the C cell. So 1 and 2 o'clock, do show up to those. That'll be your last formal review or office hours, your last formal contact with anyone who has an official capacity in this course before the midterm on Monday afternoon. Uh, I will try to take questions online through the weekend if people want to post them there. but. You would probably be better served just to show up on Friday. Uh, but if you have a last minute question, throw it online and I'll see what I can do. Other logistical thing, I sent out a little Google Docs survey for the programming assignments this semester. I do appreciate your feedback on those. It is, of course, optional and it is anonymous. But if you would be so kind as to fill it out, I do use that information to help us restructure the programming assignments next year. Um, we introduce some new ones every year. We try to make them more applicable to what you guys will be doing in the real world and more enjoyable. So do check in. Let me know where we went wrong or where we went right so we can use that data for next year. You're also always welcome to send me an email and tell me what you think of me or the course or anything like that. But if you prefer the anonymous format, the survey won't let me find out who you are unless you know you paste your name into the notes field. But if you're decently careful, the survey will let me find out who you are. <laughs> so um, do fill out that survey if you haven't already. It's on Moodle. It also went out in an email. Uh, there's a couple of links to it on Moodle. It should be easy to find. Optional, but it'll only take you five minutes, uh, I promise. So unless you have a lot to say. But otherwise, it'll take you five minutes. Just a few quick questions on each assignment. I will appreciate you filling it out. So thank you in advance. Any logistical questions? Midterm review sessions, problem set five. You all should be either done with or soon to be completing your grading session for programming assignment five. If you haven't scheduled one of those yet, it's probably not a good thing, and you should contact me sooner rather than later. I think the last day of the grade formally scheduled grading sessions are tomorrow. Show up. If you've missed yours, you should probably email me too so we can work something out. But uh, really, there's not going to be any more problem set or programming assignment grading after Friday, so 
kind of have between now and Friday to work out any mistakes on this one or any previous ones. Do check your grade, make sure it looks correct, all that jazz. If you missed your, never got a grade on one of the old programming assignments because you never showed up to your grading session, bring that up now, not in two weeks. Because uh, if there's any hope of fixing it, it exists in the next three or four days, not a week after this. All right? Okay. Nothing else in this room. So, what are the questions on this problem set? Um, so, for the first one, should the number of bytes be a really large number? Should the number of bytes be a really large number? Um, well, it depends on what you categorize as really large. We're getting 10 million? Yeah, it shouldn't be that large. Um, <laughs> So the first question is a little bit confusing. All it's actually asking you to calculate is the amount of space it takes to essentially store the file system overhead, right? The amount of space it either takes in the file allocation table to store all the appropriate references to the Just file. Just the overhead? Just the overhead. So not including the actual data? Not including the actual data. Okay. So it doesn't exactly make that clear, but it's essentially you have a fat system and you have a binary system. And what it's really asking is how much space does it take for the file system to represent this file in either of these file systems, not including the data on the file itself. Okay. So we assume that data is stored on disk and takes up four kilobytes. I mean, that pin I posted online is accurate. It gives you this four kilobyte per, so it gives you this four kilobyte per block metric, right? If you find yourself using this in any of your calculations, you're doing something wrong. Uh, it gives you this, but you don't actually need it. Uh, what's relevant is the number of blocks and then all the data it gives you about how much space it takes up in the in the file table and how much space it takes up in an inode structure. Uh, so this it never actually comes into play and you shouldn't need it. I don't know if you would get into the millions if you use that or not, but you might. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just the overhead. Ignore the data portion. Over the working of uh, that with their uh, table thingy and I know with their tree thingy, like how they actually work. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you have a file, it exists somewhere on disk, right? These are both non continuous systems. So the file's been divided up into blocks, it's stored in blocks on disk. It may not be a continuous set of blocks. It might be scattered across X number of blocks, right? So we need some way of keeping track of, if I say I need file X, I need some way of it telling me which blocks are make up file X and in what order those blocks make up file X, right? So in a FAT system, we store, which I mean, the derivatives you see today are FAT32 and FAT16, but you essentially, the, all, all FAT systems have in common you're storing all this data in a big table pre-allocated at the start of the disk. So at the start of the disk, you have some table. This table has one entry for every block on the disk. So if your disk is of size n, and your disk has, well, we'll say, we have a really tiny disk, right? It has 10 blocks, okay? So if we have a disk with 10 blocks, then this table is going to have 10 entries. Okay, so we have 10 block disks, we have 10 entries, maybe we have two files, right? We have file A, and we'll say it takes up three blocks, and we have file B, and we'll say it takes up four blocks. Good thus far? So on our disk, we have these two files. We just have index, I and mean, this is the table that has indexes, right? It will be good to hear this and start at zero. So we have index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So blocks zero through nine, right? These blocks all have locations somewhere on disk. The block size is constant. So if it's 512 byte blocks, then we can immediately find where on disk each of these blocks start, right? Block zero is gonna start right after the file location table. Block one is gonna start 512 bytes after that, so on and so forth. Given this number, we can locate the block on the disk. So all that remains is, well, we need to figure out how we're gonna use this table to tell us which of these files is which. So these files have some data structure somewhere, some different ways of doing this, but 
they're in a directory somewhere, they have some data structure where each of these files contains a pointer to essentially its entry in the table that corresponds to its first block. So all the table really has to keep track of is where all the other blocks are, because the first block will just be referenced directly from the file. So let's say file A is stored in blocks, it's kind of fragmented, we'll say this is, so A has three blocks, we'll say this is A1, we'll say this is A2, and we'll say this is A3, okay? So those are our three A blocks. So the A file pointer is essentially going to have some reference where it's pointing to entry two here in the table, right? Now the job of entry two is, entry two needs to know where the next block is. So in entry two, we're essentially gonna store the block address of the next entry. So entry two is gonna store a value of six, right? Entry six then is gonna store a value of four, because that's where block three is. And entry four, because it's the end of the file, is gonna store some special signal, so it's generally some null terminator or something that tells us there are no more blocks. So if we want to read all of block, all of file A, we look at the A file descriptor, it says we'll start at two. We go here to two, two says okay, when you're done reading this block, go to six, we read block six, it says go to block four, we then read block four and we hit the end of the file. Right? End of file, right? It's all just stored in the table. This then so we know if we actually want to access this file on disk, first we're going to block two. Then from the table, we can find out that when we're done reading through block two, we're going to have to read block six. When we're done reading through block six, we're going to have to read block four. When we're done reading block four, we're going to hit the end of file. So the table is essentially implementing a linked list, right? It's just a table-based implementation of a linked list, where each of these is basically holding a reference to the next spot in the table you need to go to. Have I lost anyone? Happy to try something different if this isn't working. So give a shout. Okay, um, I won't do file B, but same kind of concept, right? You have it spread out, it would store its references, so on and so forth. Obviously, you have to store file B in places not already occupied by file A. So that's how file allocation table works. The disadvantage, biggest disadvantage to file allocation table is in order to find all of the nodes associated with the file, I'm going to have to read through, I'm going to have to follow the linked list, right? I can't. I, 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 if you ask me what's the fourth block that this file is using, I can't see that immediately from the table. i got to start at the first block until I get to the fourth block, and then I have your answer. For small files, that's no big deal. But if you have files composed of 10,000 blocks because it's, it's 12 gigs or something, it's going to take me a long time just to dance through this table and find out all the blocks, um, especially if I have some random access thing that needs to hit right in the middle. So to do a little bit better, you can use inodes, which is what Unix, I mean, this is what, this is kind of what ext and stuff uses on Unix. This is what the virtual file system on Unix uses. So this illusion is maintained, even if this isn't what's actually happening behind the scenes. So with an inode, this is not pre-allocated. We have some block on disk that's we store some reference to it. It could be like at the start of the file or something. It can be anywhere. Um, but we have some block on this disk that's our first inode. And this inode is going to store references. So these are all memory addresses now, or addresses on the disk, right? So we now have some file A. It just stores the memory address of the first inode. So it's pointing here to this inode. We can then go to this disk, pull off this inode. This disk has addresses to other blocks on there. So this could be pointing, we have actual disk blocks. So that could be the first block the file has, this could be the second block. These don't have to be continuous. These blocks could be anywhere on disk, right? This could be block 72, this could be block 347, this could be block 13. Um, but each of these pointers essentially is going to store the disk block address of all the blocks for this file. Now, there's a limit here. If we have any of that problems, we can go five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, we'll use 10. Uh, in your example here, it's 15. But the point being, what if I have a file that's bigger than 10 blocks? Well, there's a couple of ways to do it. We could just have this last block be a pointer to another block, right? And have another 15, so on and so forth. Um, this would get tedious if the file gets big enough. If I just do it here, it's kind of like a singly linked list from one block to the next. And it starts to have the same problem as that. If I need to make some random access, I have to follow the link through each one. So as a slight optimization of this, we essentially do this, 
but we do it in a multi-dimensional manner. So we have, we, we, we go forth and we say, well, we're going to have a single indirect block, a double indirect block, and a triple indirect block. So we're going to say, we're going to take this, single, double, triple. So we'll say these first x blocks, these are all going to be direct blocks. So these are all going to point directly to the first seven blocks of this file on this, right? If the file is seven blocks or less, these never even get used. We just, if we just have one inode, it stores all seven blocks. If you're using 512 byte blocks, this would work for files up to three and a half kilobytes, right? Um, file gets bigger than that, then what we're going to do is we're going to go to our, what we call our first single indirect block. So this is going to store a pointer to another inode that also has 10 entries, where all 10 of these entries then point to blocks. Okay? So from this block, we can essentially, so now we have, we have our first seven singly direct blocks, and now we have 10, or we have our first seven direct blocks, we have 10 singly indirect blocks, right? So we follow one level of indirection, then we get 10 direct blocks. These are all now direct blocks. So on and so forth. Well, if we get bigger than that, so we can hold up to 17 blocks now, but we might still want to do better. So here we have what's called a doubly. This next one we say is going to point to a doubly indirect list. I'm going to run out of, I'm going to go in this direction because I can throw everyone for a loop. So same concept applies. But this one's going to store a pointer to another inode, but this inode is going to have no direct blocks. So it has its 10 entries, but all 10 of these entries point to other inodes themselves. And then these point to blocks. Right? So I can now store up to, well, this is the first seven, this is the next 10, this is the next 100, right? Because there's 10 here, each of these has 10, and then those each has 10. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 100, right? So I'm now up to 117 blocks that I can store. Well, the pattern continues. If I need more than that, this one, I kind of room to draw it, points to a triple indirect block, where it points to an inode, that points to an inode, that points to an inode, that points to a set of blocks. So now we can store another thousand blocks via this reference, right? And you can keep going if you exceed that. So traditionally, it was designed such that this led to some extent we still do this. This last triple indirect block gave you, was big enough to reference every block on the file system. So the biggest file you could have, a file that took up the entire disk, you had enough blocks that could reference it from there. Um, today we do a couple of different things. I mean, you can go to, you can obviously extend this pattern. You can go to a four-way indirect block. So you can extend this until you reach that same thing. Or you can do other things where you say, well, if I run out of triple indirect blocks, it's going to have another triple indirect block. Or the last block here is going to be a triple indirect block. I mean, you can get more clever. But for your purposes, you can assume you never have anything more than triple indirect blocks. That is big enough to represent any file that ever be stored on disk in this for the examples you're dealing with. The advantage to this is our referencing can be much faster. If you need the sixth block on this, I don't have to follow any links, right? I just look right here. I know exactly where that is. If I need the tenth block on this, I only have to follow one link. I follow this, and then I can pull it directly out of this table. I don't have to dance through the table at all. If I need the 90th block, I have to dance through a couple of these. If I only have to do two, I only have to dance through two tables. Whereas to find the 90th block in the fat, I have to dance through 90 cells, right? So here it's two searches, there it would be 90 searches. So this allows you to get to random blocks much more quickly than you would be able to in a fat. People okay on this? So why are there uh, maximum file sizes on modern file systems? If you can just do that infinitely, can you just like... Well, there are file sizes because you can't do this infinitely. Because they don't have some infinitely extendable system, right? They say we're going to go up to quadruply and direct blocks and we're going to stop. And then that imposes some maximum file size. No. You could make it such that you could, I mean, some file systems don't have maximum file sizes. But the systems that still do, it's often tied to some structure like this where they just said, look, we don't want to deal with the special case of what you do after you hit six way in direction. That's big enough to represent 400 gigabyte files, we're going to call it a day. Um, things like ext4, the I mean there is a limit, but it's in like the multi terabyte level, so you're probably not going to. I mean that's that's not the file system limit, that's the file limit. So 
you're probably not going to worry about it. But yeah, um, it's generally they've made the decision that designing this to allow style files of unlimited size would be not worth the overhead. So instead, they're going to institute some file limit. They say, well, it's easier just to stop at six, have a constant rule. Otherwise, you have to write some special case that when you get to the last one, it switches to some different mode, right, where you can start chaining things on. And often, that's not worth the added complexity for the minimal benefit of the one dude who eats files that day. What is a common solution to that? Like, that you have that last entry of the, of the third? Yeah, there's all kinds of solutions. Be, like, if it went to a fourth one, one but yeah, you essentially. One or you can, you can have just the last one could just be a single, just a singly linked list, right? Mm -hmm. Where it just always points to another I know, and that one always points yeah, to the next one. So yeah. you can have another one of these, which then has a seven three yeah. more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, there are multiple ways of doing it. Yeah, there's a lot of ways of doing it. In reality, you yeah, often don't do that. You just implement something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, if you've got something that's using our own terabyte file, you have other problems. Well, you gotta realize, so this grows exponentially, right? So even just adding one one, even just going up to five way in direction, we're growing exponentially. So you can start to represent files very large. Going up to six way in direction, you can represent files twice as big as the domain. You get much bigger, much faster. So. Uh, so those are all called like index blocks. So when you do your so this is yeah this is called inode yeah it's a, it's they're all kind of called index blocks but yeah you, you generally refer to this as the primary inode and then like the first indirect inode okay. this is also a first indirect but this is the first indirect on the line of two level indirection okay. they don't have perfect names they're all technically inodes so yes singly indirect doubly indirect and triply so is so this is direct or? this is singly indirect. This is doubly indirect. Oh, I didn't draw triply indirect. Triply indirect would have three I nodes plus the initial I node. Be pretty much direct blocks. Okay. Like I said, this illusion is maintained on a lot of modern file systems, even if this isn't actually what they're doing on disk. Sometimes it's beneficial to maintain this illusion, even if they're doing a big journal on the disk and they're just writing things sequentially or stuff like that. So you get into some, sometimes we've decided that this is a nice illusion to have, even if that's not what's actually going on. But with some file systems, these are storing references directly to the address on disk. Uh, in some file systems, these store like virtual addresses that have some other level below them that are actually determining how they're getting laid out on disk. Yeah, structure like this, how is fault tolerance uh, working? I mean, if you lose one of these links, you, one of the, I know, no you have way. copies of them. You just have copies. Okay. So uh, EXT file systems and, and yeah, the original Unix file systems, yeah, basically write multiple copies of these in different places on disk. Oh, okay. And there is a method for finding, given the location of one, there's a method for finding where the first copy is okay. and stuff like that. Often it can't be done, sometimes you can't always find it, sometimes you have to Sometimes you put like a special byte flag at the beginning of these. Uh -huh. So you have to search the entire disk before you can find it. So things like FS check and some of these disk utilities, I mean, that's what they, yeah. but that's what they're doing. They're searching that you lost an inode. So they're searching the entire disk to try to find all the inodes on the disk and rebuild that map in reverse. So they can't do it in real time, but you can still recover if you're willing to run the repair utility. And that's, yeah, that's what a lot of the repair utilities, I mean, they're fixing up, yes, something broke, and now they have to go through the hard way and try to fix it. I remember the nightmare FS check on ESD2 after a power failure. Yeah, well, well fortunately, the power failure issue's gotten way less <laughs> relevant than it used to be because ext 4 has a journal that sits in front of us that helps avoid some of those issues. But uh, yeah, if you corrupt this data structure, I mean, at some point, you've corrupted it beyond recoverability and you're host. Mm -hmm. But there are some levels of redundancy in place that. At least if you're running to run some big tool that can search your entire disk, you might be able to save yourself. Other questions? So not related to items, the other stuff this assignment goes into. So there are questions about, I mean, anything about disk scheduling. First come, first serve, first scan, first look, anything like that. Questions about SSH? I think didn't Dr. Hunt covered the replay attack and the man in the middle on stuff, right? Uh, I don't I know what he covered. You sat through his class, yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah. But I think that's what he, he was intending to cover. I mean, eavesdropping. What, what's the distinction? Yeah. I know he did all those yesterday. He did. Okay. What's the distinction between eavesdropping and I know what a man in the middle attack and replay attack? So or, no, no. eavesdropping is. Is the prerequisite to both those, right? Oh, right. Um, so, so eavesdropping, yeah, just saying you're listening to their traffic. Okay. 
Yeah. Perform a man in the middle attack. So a man in the middle is more than just eavesdropping, right? Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. catching all the traffic with one in, you're tampering with it, right. and then you're forwarding it along. Eavesdropping is just, you're, you're just not. listening. You may be eavesdropping is completely okay. passive, right? Right, right, right. You might not actually do anything. Same with the replay, you have to eavesdrop to capture the data that you're going to re-inject later as part of the replay. Um, questions on, yeah, I guess SSH is the last question on here. Uh, question on SSH, how in detail did you want us to go? It just is describe in general or? Uh, high level. I mean, you should describe like how the handshake takes place. I mean, the basics of how the handshake takes place, what the next step after that is, where are symmetric keys getting introduced, stuff like that. I mean, you don't need to go and rip out the RFC and, and rewrite it for me, right? Um, Waiting for someone to do that, just stick to the RFC. <laughs> <laughs> it would be good if you'd ever actually written. I mean, this probably would never happen, and it's, it's long enough away. But there was a time when these RFCs aren't written by like big famous people in official positions of power, guys. Most of the internet, these RFCs are written by college students and, and early researchers that were dinking around when we were inventing the internet. It's like, wouldn't it be cool if we did this? Let's publish a paper on how we could do this. And that's the one everyone uses. So there was a time when the person sitting in your class might have been the person who wrote the, wrote the RFC. And then they could just submit the RFC as, as their own work. But we've gotten 20 years past that point. Um, so in the general sense of, so a lot of the things you've covered recently are uh, security and networking. You should have, I mean, there's always the question of, well, how in-depth do you need to know for the final and stuff like that? You should be familiar enough with the examples in class that you should reproduce them. So you should know enough about security to be able to talk intelligently about SSH and kind of the surrounding issues, right? So you should be able to talk about SSH, you should be able to talk about um, public key encryption, you should be able to talk about symmetric encryption. Uh, you should be able to talk about the basic attacks, right? Replay, eavesdropping, man in the middle, kind of what those mean in general. You don't need to dive so far in that you like know the specific algorithms to exactly, I mean, exactly what they work. Uh, you don't need to know uh, the exact ways that public key infrastructure is put in place, stuff like that. But you should have a general understanding. Same with networking. You don't need to know all the details of networking, but you should probably know what TCP IP layer model looks like, right? Like what those four layers are from network up to application. You should, the example that Professor Han really likes to use is the NFS example. So your book does goes into detail on NFS, so the network file system, because it combines networking and file systems. So you should have enough of an understanding of that that if you got like this SSH question here, if you got a question like that, you should be able to do it. If I said describe the basics of the NFS or how NFS works, you should be able to tell me what happens on an open, what happens on a close, so on and so forth, right? You should know the basics of the NFS protocol. Um, you should just know the basics of networking. If you got a general networking question of What's the purpose of such and such a layer? You should be comfortable being able to answer that, um, especially within the TCP IP model. That's kind of the most recent stuff. The final exam is cumulative for the entire semester, so anything's fair game. That said, I would wager that 75% of the points deal with stuff since the midterm. So that's kind of virtual memory forward. Uh, so maybe focus your studying there. You do need to be familiar with what we covered the first half of the semester, but it's less stressed on the on the final exam than the more recent material. Um, you should definitely be reviewing your midterm. If there was stuff you missed, make sure you understand it. It's extra embarrassing to miss virtually the same question two times in a row, right? So look over your midterm. That's probably, if you're comfortable with the material, if you're comfortable with your midterm and the answers, and you look over, we release the answers and stuff like that. If you're comfortable with all that, that's probably fairly adequate studying for the first half of the semester. Uh, then you'll need to focus on everything we've done since then, which is virtual memory on. There's not a practice exam for this, but uh, Professor Hahn, if he hasn't done it already, I think he's planning to on Thursday. Uh, we'll kind of, I mean, more or less what I'm doing now, right? But go over a general list of the topics that you should probably be focusing on. Uh, in addition to that, make sure you're comfortable, especially with the last two problem sets, as well as the problem sets before that. But again, focus on kind of the stuff since the midterm. I can't remember if problem set three was before or after the midterm, but if it, would mean if it was after midterm, focus on it too. Uh, make sure you're comfortable with everything in the lecture material. You should hopefully have either read or had a solid understanding of the chapters in your textbook from virtual memory forward. That is stuff that's going to be featured heavily on this exam. That's kind of what it's going to be about. Uh, so are there any questions in the broader sense on anything we've touched on from virtual memory forward? 
no virtual memory, there's I.O. scheduling, so disk scheduling, there's file systems, there's things like RAID in there, so kind of some of these other I.O. technologies, RAID stuff like that. More recently, there's been networking then, security, we talked about those. Happy to, I'm happy to pretend I can talk about any of this stuff if people want to ask about it. Question on the RAID, so are we going to have to memorize all the RAID systems and multiple choice? What does it look like? It's not going to be multiple choice. All the, the, the midterm will, or the final will be a lot like the midterm. It'll all be kind of long answer. Yeah. Or short long answer, right? Like, right, you need to. Uh, I don't know if I would say you need to have all the RAID levels memorized and exactly what they are, but you should be familiar enough with them that I said, explain me three different RAID levels and what they do that you can do something like that, right? Really, memorizing all six RAID levels that are in common, I mean, it's really not hard to actually memorize every RAID level, right? Because it follows a pattern. I mean, so you have RAID 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and 6. Where these three RAID levels nobody ever uses, and they kind of are all the precursor to RAID 5. So RAID 2, 3, 4, and 5 all use basically the same concepts. It's just an iterative approach, right? These are the early phase ideas, and then they got a little bit more clever, and then they got a little bit more clever, and then they finally landed on what actually seems to be a good combination of what works. So these are very similar. The differences between these levels is kind of in the details only, uh, where RAID 5 is what we actually use. RAID 6, then, the concept is very similar to RAID 5. It just adds an additional level of parity, right? So if you understand what's going on in RAID 5, you just say, well, by magic, there's another Way that there's two ways of calculating parity in RAID 6, so you can lose two disks at once instead of just one. Right? RAID 1 is straightforward, it's just perfect mirroring. RAID 0 is straightforward, it's just perfect stripping. So you write a byte here, then you write back there, write a byte here, write back there. RAID 1 is you write the byte, you write the byte. You write the second byte, you write the second byte. So on and so forth. All of the other RAID levels are combinations of these, right? So RAID 10 is really RAID 1 plus 0. So I mean, it follows, right? You have a RAID 1 system, and then you take two RAID 1 arrays, and you put a RAID 0 on top of them, so on and so forth. I mean, you have like 5 plus 0. You have, there, there's a whole bunch of different combinations here. But really, there are three RAID levels to understand. There's RAID 0, there's RAID 1, and there's RAID 5. And everything else is either a expansion upon or an earlier version of or a combination of those three things. So. No, you don't necessarily have all of these memorized. I definitely would not. I mean, you should kind of understand what was going on here. The difference between RAID 4 and 5 is really simple, so that's an easy one. But um, if you're really going to focus on, I mean, understand RAID 0, 1, RAID 1, RAID 5, and probably RAID 6, and I think you would be in good shape uh, as to what, what you'd have to do on the final. But again, if you know those, you really do know them all. So you'd be fine either way. Any other security related questions? That's a lot of what has been touched on recently. Does everyone know what the four TCP IP layers are? If it asks you to describe like the layers of the network stack, it, could you just give the OSI model as well? Yeah, okay. I think we would accept either. The TCP IP model is easier, right. and it's the one that actually reflects what gets used in the real world. Um, what well, depends on what's been hammered into you. <laughs> well, unless, I don't know, you've been dealing with, uh, I don't know, where have you been that you've been using the OSI model? Cisco certs. Cisco certs. Um, yeah, Cisco does like their OSI model. Yeah. Part of the reason no one actually uses it in the real world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd be fine with the OSI model, model as well. Uh, you should understand, I mean, you know the OSI model, you should know the TCP IP model anyway, right? You should know yeah. they're kind they of incompatible. Yeah, they just merge. You can merge them into each session other. Session and application. Yeah. 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 But no, if, if it said describe such and such a layer, describe which layer does this, use whatever model you're more comfortable with. We'll definitely accept that. Anything else? DMs, anything on that? Have you talked about, maybe that'll be Thursday, has he talked about VMs at all yet? 
Okay, so that'll be the last thing you touch on is virtual machines. So you'll want to have a little bit of understanding of that too. Uh, mainly the high level, like what does para virtualization do? What does hardware virtualization do, right? If you're kind of familiar with that level of things, you should be able to. So there are review sessions this Friday. Uh, I will try to also be available via email over the weekend if you have any last minute questions. Again, Monday's not going to be the best time to ask questions, so the sooner you email them to me, the more likely they are to be answered. Or post them on the discussion group if you think they will benefit everyone. Um, other than that, thanks a lot, guys. I will maybe see you on Friday, otherwise, we'll see you at the final on Monday. So, I haven't been following.